Father, this morning we give you all the glory and honor. Blessed, O Lord, be your holy name. We are not tired of testifying to your power, your glory, and your grace on the earth and in our lives. We thank you because you are a God that is reliable, a God that never change. You are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and you are the same forever. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of knowing you. And thank you, Lord, for the great privilege of serving you. We we'll give you praise. We we'll give you glory. This morning, I set our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask that our worship this morning will be acceptable by you as a sweet-smelling savor, a fragrance of grace in your presence in the name of Jesus. And again, Lord, we commit the last aspect of today's service into your hand that you will take all the glory today again. You will take control. Let there be a release of grace from heaven to teach us and to instruct us and to empower us and to encourage us and to put the devil to shame by the teaching and the understanding of your word. We receive that your word will come with express power, accuracy, and understanding. We receive understanding like never before. We will not misunderstand your word. We will hear what you are saying, and then we will do what you want us to do. Great Holy Spirit, be free among us. Speak to us like you will speak to your people. Spare us of no truth. Spare us of no mystery. Spare us of no uh, revelation that will benefit our life and take us further in your purpose. By the end of the service, Lord, may we have the fullest cause to glorify your holy name. Holy Spirit, be free in this place. Glorify Jesus and establish the counsel of the Father. Thank you, Father. Blessed, blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's a privilege again to be here this morning. Let's celebrate Jesus this morning. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Amen. Every time you wake up, I want you to thank God for life. Thank God for your life. Thank God for the gift of life. We continue to realize every day that life is a gift. A gift from God. And uh, you are not better off than people that have passed on. But it has pleased God to spear and to show us his mercy. So don't forget to bring your thanksgiving to God as your first point of call every day. Is that okay? In fact, there are seasons that you will not even want to ask anything. You just want to praise him. You just want to thank him for the gift of life. In fact, many of us would have come to a place that even if God didn't do anything again in your life, for the rest of your life, it will not stop you from thanking God. How many of us have come to that place? That assuming God didn't do anything again for you, you will just continue to thank him. The whole of our life is not enough to bless his holy name. So I want to welcome you again to this last aspect of the service today. I will thank God for what God did in the Sunday school session. Now this morning, I want us to open our Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading verses 4, 5, and 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. You know that we, are, we have a journey that the Holy Ghost is taking us through. The word of the Lord for this month is that the month of May is our month of lifeline of mercy. That the mercy of God will make all the difference in our lives. And uh, what we are doing is to teach around that prophetic provision. When God speaks, his word becomes a weapon for you to fight the battles of life. 
and to win over the devil in that season. What God has said is not just spoken for decoration. What God has said is for us to take as a weapon. Is that okay? Tell somebody the word of God is my weapon. Say it again. The word of God is my weapon. Let's take it again. The word of God is my weapon. You know, if life is just like a physical battle, we would have gone for different kinds of weapons to fight our visible enemies. Yes or no? Many of us would have gone for gun so that you just look for the house of your enemy and you're going to level it down. Many of us would have gone for knife. Some people would go for cutlasses. Some people go for different kinds of weapons. But life is not like that. And the battle of life is not a physical battle of gun or cutlasses or cut gel or any other physical instrument. The battle of life is a spiritual battle. That is why, if you are a believer, for every season there will be a word from God. Every prophetic declaration over a particular season becomes your weapon. Is that okay? That's why the Bible says, and take the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the word of God does not become a sword until you have put it in your mouth. How many of you know that sword has two double-edged sides? That's why it's a sword. If it's cutlass, it has only one cutting side. Yes or no? Cutlass has one cutting side. Sword is the two sides are for cutting. So how is the word of God become sword? When God spoke it out and it was written down, that is the one side for cutting. But the day you begin to put what God has spoken into your mouth and you start to speak it out in faith, it is the second cutting is ready. So the word of God does not become the sword of the spirit until you put it in your mouth and speak it to situation. That's the greatest advantage you have as a child of God. The word of God is your greatest advantage. What God has said about this season, you will pick it up as your weapon and put it in your mouth and begin to speak it and begin to speak it. Is that okay? It becomes a sword. When you speak what God has spoken, did you get that? How many of you got that? When is the word of God the sword of the spirit? It becomes a sword when you speak what God has spoken. When God spoke it, the first edge was sharpened. When you begin to speak it, the second edge will be sharpened. Every time you speak the word of God, you are wielding a sword in the spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Now, many of us don't understand this principle until the day of temptation comes. Until the day of temptation comes. But you are going to be at a better advantage before the day of temptation and trials come to know that the word of God becomes the sword of the spirit when you speak what God has spoken. Don't speak what you hear. Don't speak what you see. It may look like the devil is winning when you look at the realities around, but speak what God has spoken. That is when you wield a sword in the spirit. The devil has respect for the word of God in your mouth. The same way he respects the word of God in the mouth of Jesus. And can I tell you something? The word of God will do for you the same thing it will do for Jesus. Tell somebody the word of God is my weapon. You can talk to your body. You can begin to speak the word of God to your body. Regularly I do that. I speak to my joint that you will carry me to the last day. 
I speak to my legs. I speak to my eyes. I speak everywhere. Keep speaking. Don't wait until you are sick before you begin to speak to your body. The Bible said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are what? They are life. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? And the Bible said the word of God is quick and it is powerful. Able to pierce through. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So, the Bible is not just for decoration and all that. Take the word of God as your weapon. Any season that God has spoken about is the season you must never be a victim of. Did you hear what I just said? Any season that God has spoken about is the season that you must never be a victim of. There is nothing happening in Nigeria today or there is nothing happening in the world today that God has not spoken about. And that's why you as a child of God must never be a victim of what is happening today, especially the negative event. Just take what God has spoken and put it in your mouth and begin to say it by faith. Life will begin to bow to you. The devil will begin to bow to you. Demons will begin to run away. Because even when the devil came to Jesus, three times he spoke to Jesus. Three times Jesus spoke back to him. The word of God. And the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone. The word bread there means food. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Be a smart Christian. Tell somebody, be a smart Christian. Tell somebody, be a smart Christian. You know, it, it makes me sad as a person. When people have, have had to attend to people that are in the hospital, and then I say, let's pray. And they begin to, hey, my body, my head, hey, 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 hey. I don't know, I, I don't know how I'm feeling, no. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And at occasions, it makes me sad. I say, why have you been hearing the word of God all these years? You are still saying, my body, I don't know, I'm, I don't know, my, I don't know, I don't know, I'm feeling cold. I, I said, that's not what you should be saying now. I've had to teach people, even on their sick bed, that put the word of God in your mouth. I shall not die, but live. Are you hearing me now? You are dealing with a devil that is using sickness to drag your body with pain. And the devil is working to kill you 24-7. And you are, all, you, are, you are confessing and reiterating what you feel. You have no business with your healing. You have business with your healing. Tell somebody, I have no business with my feeling. I have business with my healing. And if you are going to get healing, you must put the word of God in your mouth. Let me see your Bible. Bible is not decoration. Let me see your Bible. Raise it up. Raise it up. That's why you have to read that word and put it in your mouth. Many of us will have to read ahead of the times of problems. Many of us have to study and meditate, get the word of God inside you ahead of the time of temptation. So that any time the devil shows up, you speak the word of God back. You speak the word of God back. There are no two ways about it. That's how Jesus did it. That's how you should do it. Are you hearing me now? You have been in church for many years. You shouldn't be the one that will say, Hey, my head, oh, hey, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. When you say you are dying, you are helping the devil to kill you. This is a devil that wants you dead. So to say, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, is to open the door for the spirit of death. Are you hearing me now? Even though it looks as if you are going to die, it's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord with long life. He satisfied me and he showed me his salvation. Before he can show you his salvation, it means there are problems, isn't it? He showed me his salvation. He showed me his deliverance. He showed me his victory. Because that's what salvation contains. 
put the word of God in your mouth. It's a discipline that will determine either you will live or you will die in these last days. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? When I was very strong, I gave the testimony here. I never for one minute, not for one minute, not for one second, spoke my feeling. As terrible as that, as the reputation of that infection is. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? I never for one minute spoke my feeling. I was speaking the word of God. I was speaking the word of God. I was too confident that it's a lie. The devil is a lie. He brought the suggestion of death, but I didn't agree with it. Are you hearing me now? I did, if it's something I've not passed through, you feel that maybe he has not passed through. That's why he's talking like that. But let me tell you, it works. It works. It works. It works. Learn the discipline of speaking the word of God before the day of temptation comes. That's why you are in church. I kept on putting the word of God in my mouth. I kept on putting, my wife was speaking the word of God. It's part of our discipline. Nobody speaks negative around us. I speak the word of God. I speak the word of God. I will not die, but live. Even when I had no strength to talk, in my, my mind, I was speaking the word. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move my mouth, but my mind didn't stop. I was speaking the word of God. 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 And at a particular hour, I opened my mouth again. I spoke out the word of God. From that time, I have not stopped speaking. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? There was no time that I said, oh, I'm dead. Oh, I'm finished. Ah, no, 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 no. All right? Are you hearing what I'm saying now? The word of God works. Tell somebody the word of God works. Say it again, it works. Say it again, it works. Say it again, it works. Because behind every sickness, there is a demonic spirit. And that's why most times, some sickness don't even, will not, will not stop because of drug. Because there's a demonic spirit. There is, a, there is the reality of the spirit of affliction. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? But when you begin to speak the word of God, it counter that spirit. It silenced the oppression of that spirit. That's why you are different. You are not a believer because you are Samuel. You are a believer because you believe the word of God. And you are speaking the word of God. You are not a Christian because you attend abundant grace. You are a Christian because you believe what God has said. Not minding what is happening. You choose to believe what God has said. Not minding how you are feeling. You choose to believe what God has I said, and then you begin to speak it, you begin to speak it in faith. Even in the hospital, you put the word of God in your mouth. Even if you have to take your drugs, you put the word of God in your mouth. And then you come out victorious. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? I hope somebody got something. So, about this season, God has spoken. And what has he said? That is mercy is our lifeline. How sure am I that you are going to go through this season on heart? It is because the mercy of God is your lifeline. Tell somebody, God's mercy is my lifeline. God's mercy is my lifeline. Say it again. God's mercy is my lifeline. You know? No matter how low things are, the mercy of God is the lifeline that will bring you up. And once you have an encounter with the mercy, you hold on that mercy and you begin to climb up. And you begin to climb up. And you begin to climb up. So, I've been teaching around it. Uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about understanding the mercy of God. Last week, I spoke about the manifestation of God's mercy, part one. Now, today, I am speaking about the manifestation of God's mercy, part two. The manifestation of God's mercy, part two. So, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter two, 
verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. Are you there? But God, who is rich in mercy, I want you to underline that word. God is rich in mercy. That's one of the reasons why it's God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, the first thing I want you to note and probably write down in capital letters is that God is rich in mercy. Wow. What a revelation. God is rich in mercy. Write it in capital letters and don't forget it. God is what? Is rich in mercy. You know, when they say somebody is rich, it means he has an abundance of whatever he is rich in. Right? If you say that man is a rich man, that means he has money. He has abundance of money. Sometimes even more than he will ever need. You know, a rich man means that his need cannot exhaust his means. His needs cannot exhaust his money. That's why you say, ah, that man is a rich man. So when you say somebody is rich, it means he's, he has something in abundance. But when it comes to mercy, one of the reasons why God is God and why he will always be God and why he will always be better than man is because he is what? Rich in mercy. Say after me, God is rich in mercy. Now I want you to station on that verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2. God is rich in mercy. And so what is the meaning of that statement? You know the meaning is this. No mistake of man no mess of man can exhaust the mercy of God. No mistake of man, no mess of man can exhaust the mercy of God. That's the meaning of God is rich in mercy. Man has mistakes, man has mess, God has mercy. Did you hear that? Man has mistakes. Man has errors. Man can mess up. But God has mercy. And he is so rich in mercy because no mistake of man can exhaust the mercy of God. No mess or error of man can exhaust the mercy of God. Now, I have to say that very clearly. No mistake of man can exhaust the mercy of God. No mess of man. You know, man has always been messing up. Yes or no? Men always mess up. Human beings always mess up. Will make mistake. No mistake of man can exhaust the mercy of God. The mercy of God will cancel the mistakes of men. Now, that truth is very important. For you to know how rich the mercy of God is. Are you with me now? That truth is not for you to have license to continue to make mistake. And say after all, my pastor said, no mistake of man can, can exhaust the mercy of God. So I can continue to make mistake. I can continue to mess up because I know the mercy of God is there. That's not the reason for that truth. Hello, somebody. That 
truth is not for you to have license to be free to just continue to mess up. That truth is for you to understand the depth of the riches of the mercy of God. And that is one of the reasons why God is God. Did you get what I'm saying now? I am praying that every one of us will have a revelation of the mercy of God. Of the mercy of God. We will know the mercy of God beyond the written letters. So I want you to understand the context upon which that truth is declared. It is for you to know God more and to understand the depth of his mercy. It is not for you to now begin to be careless and say, well... There is no mistake I make. It cannot exhaust the mercy of God. So I continue to make mistakes even when I know this is mistakes. That is irresponsibility. That's not how God wants us to live our life. But the truth of the matter is this. God is rich in mercy. The riches of God's mercy guarantees the transformation of the redeemed man from the depth of mess and shame to the height of glory and grace. The riches of the mercy of God guarantees the transformation of the redeemed man from the depth of mess and shame to the height of grace and glory. The fa- is there anybody here who is born again? If you are born again, you are redeemed. Let me see your hand up. You are born again, you are redeemed. Beloved, that is a miracle. The redemption of man is a miracle. As a matter of fact, it is the greatest miracle. We were born in sin, you remember? We have the nature of sin, you remember? We were born under the wrath of God because we were born in iniquity. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. We have a nature of sin. By nature, we are separated from God. We threw away the image of God in the garden of his name. And we took on the image of sin, the image of iniquity. So, man was in the depth of mess and shame. But you know, how rich is the mercy of God? The man that was in the depth of shame and mess was transformed to the height of grace and glory. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Have you seen a pig before? Have you seen a pig before? A swine. What's the nature of a pig? He sleeps on the bed. And stays there quietly. If you buy a pig today. And you bring the pig into your bedroom. You lay your bed sheet everywhere is sparkling white. And you travel. One week. By the time you come back. Can you imagine the state of your bedroom? What would the pig do? He would have gone out into the mire and then bring it into your bed. And it would mess everywhere up. We were worse than a pig by nature. That's why I said your born again experience is a miracle. Which is a reflection of the riches of God's mercy. Wow. Let me take that statement again. The riches of God's mercy guaranteed the transformation of the redeemed man from the depth of mess and shame to the height of grace and glory. Man that was worse than a pig as a result of how terrible we were in sin. And how terrible the nature of sin has been upon us. But because of the richness of the mercy of God. 
we were taken away from the depth of shame, from the depth of messing up, to the height of grace, to the height of glory. The climax is that not only, God, not only that God washed us by the blood of Jesus, we became worthy of carrying the spirit of God inside us. Wow. You have the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost. That's a miracle. You don't go to the Maya again. You don't manifest the nature of a swine again. That's a miracle. If you have a pig that doesn't go to the Maya again, isn't that a miracle? It is a miracle. And it is a miracle guaranteed by the riches of the mercy of God. Let me show you three things in that passage that I've read. Ephesians chapter 2. And you will see these three things is just to show to you the riches of God's mercy. The riches of God's mercy. God is rich in mercy. You know, we can take that statement on and on and on and on. Because every activity of God, as far as man is concerned, is a demonstration of the riches of God's mercy. Everything God has shown to us, everything God has done for us, everything God will still do for us, is the expression of the riches of the mercy of God. God is rich in mercy. Look at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, how does he express the riches of his mercy? How can we evaluate the riches of his mercy? How can you know the riches of his mercy? The Bible says, because of his great love, which he loved us. Wow. So, the riches of God's mercy is expressed in the greatness of his love towards us. Isn't that a revelation? Talk to me. How do you know the riches of God's mercy? It is known by the greatness of the love of God towards you. Do you need anybody to tell you that God loves you? Hello? Do you need anybody to tell you that God loves you before you know that he does? How many of you believe that God loves him today? I know God loves me. That is a song that says, he loves me and I cannot say why. But this morning, it's like the Holy Spirit is telling us why. Why did he love us so much? Because he is rich in mercy. And love somebody. So, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 showed that God demonstrated the richness of his mercy by the greatness of his love towards us. In the modern language, we call it unconditional love. In the language of the scripture, we say agape love. Are you hearing me now? God demonstrated the riches of his mercy by the greatness of his love. How many of you have experienced the love of God? How many of you have seen the love of God? How many of you have felt the love of God? That is the expression of the riches of his mercy. How rich is the mercy of God? It is in how great is love toward us. Did you hear what I said? The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That is how he manifested the riches of his mercy. He is rich in mercy. How do I know? Because of the greatness of his love towards me. I can feel the love of God every day. You can feel the love of God every day. God loves us more than anybody could ever do. God loves us more than anyone could ever do. David said, even if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. I want you to respond to the love of God. I want you to allow the love of God to be your only hope. Because his love can never fail. The love of men can fail. Sometimes for reasons best known to them. 
but the love of God cannot fail. Hello, somebody. The love of man is conditional, but the love of God is unconditional. He loves me unconditionally. Can you say that to yourself? That God loves you unconditionally. Praise God. In Romans chapter 5 verse 8, the Bible says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Christ died for us. That's the greatest manifestation of the riches of God's mercy. If Christ died for us when we are changed, we will say it's because we are changed. Then we'll begin to walk around and boast and say it's because of the quality of my life. That's why Christ died for us. No. He died for us when we were worse. He died for us when we were terrible. He died for us when we were ignorant. He died for us when we do not know God. Christ died for us. There are many people today in the world that do not know God, but Christ had died for them in advance because of the greatness of the love of God, which is the manifestation of the riches of his mercy. I hope you understand Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Hello? Do you understand now? How do you evaluate the riches of the law, of the mercy of God? Through the greatness of his love. Are you hearing me now? Number two, look at verse five. Ephesians chapter two, verse five. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace, you had been saved. Isn't that a miracle for a dead man to become alive? When a dead man rises up, what is that? Talk to me. What is that? Is that a natural occurrence? Or a miraculous experience. We were dead in trespasses and sin. But because of the riches of his mercy. He made us alive together with Christ. Alive together with Christ. Alive together with Christ. A dead man has no relevance. How many of you agree with me? A dead man has no usefulness. A dead man is a social menace. A dead man is a public health concern. That's why they always want to quickly dispose of the body. Either you take them to the mortuary immediately or you rally around and bury them. You know, there is this eagerness to dispose of anybody dead. Yes or no? You know why? Their usefulness ended with their last breath. Their usefulness ended with their last breath. So if we do not make a way to dispose them, they become health issues for the living. You know, you know, last week there were some tenants in our house, uninvited tenants. <laughs> Praise God, that were living in my house and eating my food for free. <laughs> you know those tenants. I know it's in every house. <laughs> before you put something on the table, before you, you come back, they've, they've, they've tasted it. You know those tenants? Wow. And that they just, it became so embarrassing. That any, any, just put something and go out, come back. Uh -uh, uh -uh. And the mommy said, okay, I'm going to prepare a, a, a special diet for these tenants. And then she got rat poison. <laughs> and then she mixed it with some fish, some fried fish. You know rat love fried fish very well. And then she served it around the house. Praise God. And then how did we know that uh, it has started working? I began to perceive some terrible odors. Wow. Terrible odors. This corner, that corner, that corner. In fact, there is a corner that I didn't go for four days. I remember the particular one that uh, provoked an affair, and he was even vomiting because of this stench. Are you hearing me now? Now, I asked myself, if the carcass of rat, small rat, is as terrible as that, you now see why everybody wants to dispose of a dead person. 
Because a dead man has no usefulness. He's gone forever. So the best thing for the living is to dispose. Are you hearing me now? That was why we were what we were when we were in sin. And as many today that have not given their life to Jesus, they have no usefulness. They are not better than dead. That's what the Bible says. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Just go up there and look at verse 1. And you, at him, you he made alive who were dead in what? In trespasses and sin. The best status of an unbeliever is a dead man. An unbeliever is dead even though he's walking around. He's dead even though he's a professor. He's dead even though he's a doctor. He's dead to anything good. He's dead to anything God. He's dead to anything light. He's dead and separated from God. An unbeliever has no usefulness in the purpose of God. An unbeliever does not even understand the purpose of life. Because he has rejected life. An unbeliever is walking in darkness. Because he has rejected the light of the world. That was the position of all of us. But how rich is the mercy of God? He brought us back alive. Somebody say miraculous. That is it. You can now become sensitive to God. You now become sensitive to good. You now become sensitive to light. You now have the word of God in your heart. You now have the fear of God in your heart. You now think and live and, and think about God. You live your life and think about God. You now obey the word of God and walk in his ways as a child of God. That's the reality of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. When the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. All things have passed away and all had become new. That's how rich the mercy of God is. You were dead in sin. The mercy of God brought you back to life. Hello, somebody. And God is still doing that up till today. Okay? So the riches of God's mercy quicken us together with Christ even when we were dead in sin. Now look at verse 6. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. God did more than raising us up. Verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together where where are we seated? In the heavenly places in who? In Christ Jesus. Now, this truth are the truth that devil didn't want you to know. Because they are the truth that will guarantee your victory on the earth. They are the truth that will give you power over Satan. It is truth that make free. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Once you know the truth, the devil is afraid of you. If you are praying seven days a week without the truth, the devil is not afraid of your prayers. If you are fasting without understanding the truth of the word of God, the devil does not respect your fasting. The devil always respects a man that has the truth because truth will bring freedom. Are you with me now? You know the truth will expose the devil. You know the devil is a liar. And he churn out lies. He churn out lies. Every time the devil comes to your thought, he will lie to you. He will lie to you that you will die. He will lie to you that that thing will not work. He will lie to you that you will be disappointed. He will lie to you that something will happen in your future that is negative. Every time the devil opens his mouth, he has no capacity to say the truth. He lies. Are you with me now? And that's why your, the truth is your weapon against the devil. And the devil runs away from any man that has the truth. Just like a man that has been lying before, immediately he knows that his lie has been punctured. Will he come to where the truth is again? He will run away. The same thing the devil. Beloved, the richness of God's mercy did not only bring us to life 
it elevated us to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. We are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. Tell somebody what an elevation. Tell somebody what an elevation. Isn't that elevation? Isn't that promotion? How many of you now remember the statement I made now? The richness of the mercy of God made the transformation of the redeemed man guaranteed. So the redeemed man is brought from the depth of mess and shame to the height of grace and glory. Are you hearing me now? First, the riches of God's mercy is expressed by the greatness of his love. Secondly, the riches of God's mercy made him quicken us together, raise us from the dead, even when we were dead in our sins. And then thirdly, the riches of the mercy of God elevated us to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. And I look at what is the meaning of these heavenly places. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I read verses 20 and 21. I believe we're together today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse what? Ephesians chapter 1, verse what? Verses 20 and 21. Which he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Where? In the heavenly places. Did you get that? In the heavenly places. What is the meaning of these heavenly places? Look at verse 21. Verse 21. The Bible says what? Far above all principality. Look at me. That's the heavenly places. Well, that's where you are seated together with Christ. That is the greatest expression of the riches of the mercy of God. Far above. Somebody say far above. All principality. Underline all principality. Witches, wizard, familiar spirit, powers of the devil, powers of darkness, juju power, ogbanje power, far above. You are operating at a higher level. Listen to me. If the witches can fly, you can fly higher. Tell somebody, I am flying higher. No witch can fly to the zone where you operate from. In the realms of the spirit. Because the Bible says you are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. What is this heavenly places? Far above all principality. Far above all powers. Far above all might. Far above all dominion. And every name that is named. Whatever is the name of whatever is troubling you. Once it has a name, you are operating at a higher level than that name. Is somebody getting this today? Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That's where you, you are seated. Hello, somebody? That's your seat of authority. That is the greatest expression of the masses of God. He loved us. He raised us back to life even though we were dead in trespasses and sin. Not only, he now elevated us, promoted us to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. And the heavenly places means we are far above. You are far above the reach of the devil. You are far above the reach of the demons. You are far above the reach of Satan. You are far above all principalities. You are far up. May you understand the enormity of the power available to you. May you understand the enormity of your authority in Christ. And this is a reality because of the riches of the masses of God. Tell somebody, God is rich in mercy. So a man can stand now and say in the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan, get out of this place. And the devil will have no option than to obey. 
Oh, that's how rich the mercy of God is. A man that is always a slave to the devil before. A man that is a captive to the devil before. A man that is under the bondage and yoke of sin and Satan before. Can now say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I cast you out and the demons will listen. And they will go out. They can't argue again. You know why? You are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. May you be conscious of your position. May you be conscious of your seat in the spirit. You are seated together with Christ. Above all situation. Above all condition. Above all physical limitation. When Paul was writing the epistle to Ephesians, he was in the prison. He was in prison yard. Are you with me? Even in the prison yard, Paul had a revelational understanding of his spiritual status. He never allowed the discouragement of the environment of prison to cut down his revelation. He knew that even though physically I'm in the prison cell, but I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. May you be conscious beyond your physical limitations. May you be conscious beyond, beyond the negative realities of life. The devil wants you to look at the negative things happening at you and be affected. But the negative realities around you is not your reality. You are seated in the heavenly places. You are seated together. Tell somebody, I'm seated together with Christ. Say, I'm seated together with Christ. Do you, mean, do you know the meaning of that? Whatever cannot overcome Christ cannot overcome you. Whatever cannot challenge Christ can challenge you. Whatever cannot touch Christ can touch you. Tell somebody, whatever cannot overcome Christ cannot overcome me. That is your revelation that will help you to fight the battles of life and win. The devil wishes you do not know this secret. So he comes and harasses you. But it is your duty to tell him, look, you, 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 you are not qualified because I'm higher than you. Are you hearing me now? This is, not the, this is not the privilege of the pastors. This is not the privilege of the big men in God. But beloved, it's the privilege of every believer. It's your right. It's your heritage. We're seated together with Christ. Beloved, the mercy of God facilitated the total and dramatic transformation of man through redemption. When you give your life to Jesus, you become a wonder. Is that okay? And that's why those that are still in sin, that are still unbelievers, I pity them. I'm telling you. If you know the truth, it is no longer fashionable to live in sin again. Because what you are going to lose will be much than what you gain. Is that okay? The days are gone that people say, well, pastor just want us to get born again. No, 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 no. Get born again for yourself. Otherwise, the devil will roast you as a meat. He's been killing people and he will continue to kill people. You should not be part of the people the devil will kill. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I said? You must give your life to Jesus so that you can assess the victory. Victory over the devil. It is for your sake. It is in your own interest that you are born again. And then experience the wonder of the mercy of God. That a man that used to be a slave to the devil by the riches of the mercy of God can now become master to Satan. I can tell the devil to sit down there in the name of Jesus and the devil will sit down. Wow, what a transformation. Did you get that? What a dramatic transformation. The question is this. How is the mercy of God manifested? How? And I'll show you five ways before we go today. Now, if you follow my teaching last week, you will discover that 
the major question for last week is to whom is the mercy of God manifested? To whom? How many of you remember? If you get back to your note, you will know the emphasis of last week teaching, the manifestation of God's mercy part one is to whom is the mercy of God manifested? Now, this week, the emphasis is this. How is the mercy of God manifested? If this God is so rich in mercy, how is his mercy manifested? Hello, somebody. And I'll teach you and tell you five. Number one, the mercy of God is manifested in his pardoning sin. In his pardoning sin. Especially when sin is confessed and forsaken. The mercy of God is manifested in his pardoning sin. Especially when the sin is confessed and forsaken. Only God can pardon sin. How many of you know that men don't pardon sin? Hello? <laughs> Is it not funny? Do you know society don't pardon sin? Especially in these days of Facebook and uh, <laughs> what has happened 10 years ago. They will bring it up for you. Amen. What you did 10 years ago and now you want to be governor or you want to be chairman. They will bring all your pictures to Facebook. They will dig it. They will dig it. Do you know Facebook has a way of reminding people what they are trying to forget? How many of you understand what I'm saying now? How many of you have seen on your wall, on Facebook, they will say your story six years ago? And they will even bring your picture. In fact, some of the pictures you are trying to forget, they will bring it back to you. Except it's not loaded there. Once it is loaded there, it's there forever. They will bring it back. So society don't pardon sin at all. Oh. Just don't want to progress. Don't want to become anything. The moment you want to aspire to become something, they say, oh, who is he? Who is he? That rapist. And then they will bring it up. What has happened 10 years ago? <laughs> they bring it up. Because man has no quality of mercy. How is the mercy of God manifested? Every time you see God pardon sin, he is manifesting his mercy. They do here, especially sin that is confessed and forsaken. The Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh shall what? Shall have mercy. So God mercy is manifested in his pardoning sin. God has the capacity to pardon sin. No matter how terrible the sin is. Especially when you confess that sin and you forsake it. Now I want you to look at Exodus chapter 34 verse 7. That's the first way by which God manifest his mercy by pardoning sin. Exodus 34 verse 7. The Bible says, keeping mercy for thousands. How does he do it? Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin by no means clearing the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. And the children, children, as long as they are not confessed and forsaken. Is that okay? To the third and fourth generation. Now the point I want you to see there is that God manifests his mercy by pardoning sin. Especially when the sin is confessed and forsaken. Did you get that now? Isaiah chapter 55. I will read verse 7. Isaiah chapter 55. I read verse 7. The Bible says, Let the wicked forsake his way 
and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him what? Return to the Lord. And what will the Lord do? He will have mercy on him and to our God. For he will what? Abundantly pardon. The meaning of abundantly pardon is that he will sufficiently pardon. Did you get that? No matter the sin, no matter the terrible sin, he will sufficiently forgive. That is how he manifests his mercy. By pardoning sin. Is that okay? By pardoning sin. I want you to write down Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. Write down Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. But open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 12. The Bible says, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return. Somebody say, return. Backsliding Israel says the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall on you. Why? For I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. You know, in the, in the original King James Bible, it says, I will not keep anger forever. Beloved, God's mercy terminates the anger of God. God's mercy terminates the anger of God. God will not be angry forever on the account of mercy, especially when sin is confessed and forsaken. When sin is confessed and forsaken, the mercy of God will terminate the anger of God. He will not be angry forever. Do you know human beings can be angry forever? Hello? How many of you understand that? How many of you understand? You know, the standard of God for us in the New Testament is that be angry and sin not. Is that not? Are, you, are we together? Be angry and what? And sin not. When will your anger not become sin? Don't allow the sun to set on your anger. Only God knows how many sun have set on, on the anger of many people now. Only God knows how many years have set. Not just sun, years. Because somebody say, say that's how it, I never forget. I never forget. That's how it did, what he did in 1954. October 3. It was a Saturday. 6 p.m. exactly in the evening. Rain was falling that time. In fact, he wore his, uh, this red dress that time. Uh, he didn't forget. Really, really, really. He didn't forget. Praise God. If God says he will not be angry forever, if you choose to be angry forever, you will die quickly. Oh. Well, beloved, God said I will not be angry forever. Because the mercy of God will terminate the anger of God. Especially when sin is confessed and what? And forsaken. So the first way God manifests his mercy is in pardoning sin. I like the description of Psalm 51. Many of us have prayed several with Psalm 51 before. Am I correct? Look at how the Bible describes the mercy of God in verse 1. Psalm 51 Verse 1. Psalm 51, verse 1. The Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the word, multitude of your word, tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Multitude of tender mercies. So, God manifests his mercy by pardoning sin. Number two, the mercy of God is manifested in bearing with the sinners. Even when they harden their soul and persist in sin. The mercy of God is manifested in bearing with the sinner. 
even though when they harden their soul and persist in sin. That's another dimension. That's another dimension of the manifestation of the mercy of God. The first dimension is very easy, isn't it? When a man confesses his sin and forsakes his sin, God will pardon his sin. That is the first way by which God manifests his mercy. But this second dimension is an attestation to the riches of the mercy of God. A man that refuses to confess his sin. A man that harden his soul and continue in his sin. His sin will not be blotted out. Oh. His sin is not yet pardoned. Oh. But God will bear with him. That is mercy factor. That's mercy factor. God will bear with him. That is the patience of God. Hello, somebody. He, 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 he will he harden his sin. I mean, he hardened his soul. He's not ready to change. Even though he knows the truth. And he continues in his sin. God will not pardon that sin. No. Because until a man confesses and forsakes his sin... The sin will not be pardoned. But God will not destroy the man. He will bear with him. Hello, somebody. He will bear with him. He will be watching him. He will bear with him. He will protect him. He will be bearing with him. He will bear with him. The man continue to persist in sin. The man had in his soul. The man continue in his sin. God will bear with him. That's why many of us are not killed. Before we've eventually found repentance. Hello, somebody. How many of you know without the mercy factor, many of us would have been killed? Ever before we even become born again. Because the moment you make a mistake, God, God will just kill you. Only God knows how many times you had the offer of salvation before and you ignore it. Is it the first time you hear about Jesus that you believe Jesus? Is it the first time you hear about the gospel that you responded correctly? If, do, do, do you know that people are still in church today they are not yet born again? Will God kill them? No. He will bear with them. It will, their sin is still there. Oh. Their sin is not yet pardoned. Oh. Because their sin is not yet confessed. Oh, and not yet forsaken. Oh. But God will bear with them. That's the patience of God. God will say let me be more patient. Let me be more patient. Even though the man persists in sin. Even though the man hardened himself. Why do you think God will have to take 10 different plagues before he can take out Pharaoh? Hello? Can't he kill him immediately? Talk to me. He can. But will he? No, he will not. Especially under the New Testament. God become patient. How many of you know that what has Sodom and Gomorrah, what have they done? That Nigeria has not done times one million. Talk to me now. Huh? Assuming there is no mercy factor. God becoming patient. God bearing with men and all that. How many people will remain in Nigeria? How many people will remain in the world? Hello, somebody. That's the dimension of God's mercy. The sin is still there. Oh. The sin has not blotted out. Oh. The sin is not yet pardoned. Oh. Because it is not yet confessed and forsaken. But God will bear with that sinner. So that eventually, eventually, he will always be justified. Are you with me now? Don't wear the patience of God out. Because the mercy of God delays the judgment of God. God's mercy, what? Delays God's judgment. 
judgment is not executed speedily. So that maybe that man will change. God does not want anybody to die. God does not want anybody to perish. That's why he will be patient. It is a factor of his mercy. You have seen people that are terrible in the world and yet their things are getting better. Hello, somebody. Kidnappers are ravaging the country. Slaughtering people. One lady gave a testimony. I watched it on Facebook. How God delivered her from kidnapper. The day she was kidnapped, they kidnapped four of them. Ladies. And they took them into the thick forest. That if they cry from now till Jesus come, nobody will hear. And by the time she became conscious, they told that to, they collected her phone number and told that to call her people, call your people, everybody call your people. And then they negotiated with the people, they told them how much they are going to collect. Otherwise, they will kill. He said, by the third day, our own people are already cooperating. And uh, they are already making uh, arrangements for how the money will come to those people and all that. But the people of the other three people, in fact, it's as if they don't have anybody. And those kidnappers said, we'll give you a few more hours. Old. Call your people and tell them, we'll kill you. And they said, in the next 24 hours, if nothing is heard from your people, we'll kill you. And after 24 hours, they came and they said, your people are already saying we will pay. So we will not kill you. And they said, these three people, this one, nothing has been heard from your people. And uh, in their presence there, they called some people and, and they called some people here, which part will you need? That one said, we need the head. It will need the head. Just the head. And right there in their presence, they just carried the woman. I mean, slaughter her. Cut off her head. And dismantle her. It was as horrible as that. And they told the other one, the next 10 hours, if your people didn't come, you see what, what happened? And then 10 hours later, they came back. And they said, your people has not called. Nothing from your people. And they called again, which part do you need? And he said, he need the kidney, he need the breast, he need this, he need that. And right there in their face, just slaughter him and dismantle on the table. And then they package everything and then go again. And that's how they killed the other three people. Except her alone. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. You know why, what I think when I hear that story. I ask myself, but God was seeing them. Hello? God was looking at them. When they carried that innocent lady and slaughtered her, and God was looking at them. When they were dismantling her body, and God was looking at them. And the Holy Spirit said, you know what? That's a dimension of the mercy of God that the mind of man cannot understand. He knows they are terrible sinners, but he will bear with them. Maybe they will change. Maybe they will change. It will be patient. It will be patient. It will be patient. You know, it has gotten to a level that you can no longer understand now. If you are not in the spirit. Because if you are God, what will you do to those people? Oh yeah, talk to me. Talk to me. What will you do to those people? You will roast them. In fact, if there is a greater word for roast, you will... Ah, ah, I will shatter them. I will kill all of them. But God is not going to do that. If he had roasted Paul the apostle, how are we going to read Ephesians this morning? You know Paul was a murderer too. A cold-blooded murderer. Killing people. Only God knows how many people he has killed. And he was on a killing mission to Damascus. When God came across him, it was the mercy of God that got him that made God to be so patient, patient, patient until he gave his life to Jesus. Hello, somebody. Oh, talk to me. 
You had in the morning when I told you God is rich in mercy. So if God will immediately execute sentence of judgment, only God knows. Nobody will remain in, in this world. But God will be patient. God will be patient. Maybe this man will change his mind. Maybe this person will be better. Maybe this person will, will listen to the gospel. Maybe this person will change. God will be patient. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Bible says God is not slack. Hello? God is not what? It's not slack concerning his promise. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll read verse 9. Before you begin to say, ah, ah, what is God doing? What is God doing? Uh -uh. How can people be killing people and God will be looking at them? Now listen to this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is what? Long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish but that how many? All should come to repentance. Is that okay? So God's mercy delay God's judgment. Number three. The mercy of God is manifested in his delivering men from sickness, from sorrow and oppression. The mercy of God is manifested in his delivering men from sickness, from sorrow, from oppression. When God delivers you from sickness, he has manifested his mercy. When God delivers you from sorrow, he has manifested his mercy. If God allow what, if God allow the devil to do what he wants to do, God knows that sorrow will come. And when God delivered you from that sorrow, he has manifested his what? His mercy. When God delivered you from oppression, he has manifested his mercy. Are you with me now? So God's mercy delivers from sickness. God's mercy delivered from sorrow. God's mercy delivered from oppression. God's mercy delivered from sickness. God's mercy delivered from sorrow. God's mercy delivered from what? Oppression. Are you with me now? And I want to pray for you this afternoon that I don't know what sickness is in your body. The mercy of God will show up for you. Whatever the diagnosis is, this day, the mercy of God will deliver you from every attack of sickness, from every attack of sorrow, and from every form of oppression. In the name of Jesus, you will experience the mercy of God in this season. You will experience the mercy of God in this season. What kill others will not kill you. What grounded others will not ground you. What silent others will not silent you? You escape by mercy. You are healed by mercy. You are delivered by mercy. You escape sorrow by mercy. In the name of Jesus. Number four. The mercy of God is manifested in his maintaining the security of those who trust him. In his maintaining the security of those who trust him. Those who trust God, God maintain their security. Is there anybody who trusts God here today? Is there anybody who trusts God here today? If you trust God, God maintain your security. That is how God manifests his mercy. Psalm 21, I read verse 7. Psalm 21 verse 7. The Bible says, For the king trust in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. That's my portion in this season. I don't know about you. In this season of bad news, in this season of... How many of you know that bad news are very common now in Nigeria? 
bad news very common in the world now. In this season of bad news, I shall not be moved. When you trust in God, God will maintain your security. The greatest problem of our nation now, and indeed, one of the greatest problems, not only in Nigeria, in the world, is the problem of insecurity. But beloved, God is our security. If you trust him, he will maintain your security. That's how he shows his mercy. That's how he shows his mercy. That's how he manifests his mercy. He will protect you. He will secure your life. Hello, somebody? Is there anybody who will trust God today? Do you know that you have a very high fence? Doesn't mean you are secure. Hello, somebody? Some people can break the fence. You can build the fence. But some people will break it. These days, they don't even do much work. They just go to one corner of the fence and then carve something like circle out. They just use chisel to remove the blocks. They won't put down everything so that you won't, you won't spend much money to, <laughs> to repair. They just remove the blocks, maybe about two, three blocks there. And then from that place, they'll just go inside. Our security is of the Lord. I'm telling you, there is nowhere we cannot live as long as God is there. The Bible says, I will, what? Lift up my hands unto the hills. For when cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which makes the heaven and the earth. Are you hearing me now? In Psalm 91. Let me read to you what the Bible says in Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is not just a literature. It is your reality. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There are two shadows in the world. In the Bible, there are two shadows. We have the valley of the shadow of death. That's a terrible shadow. And then we have the shadow of the Almighty. That's security. God's shadow will come upon you this season. God's shadow will come upon your children this season. The eyes of the evil men will not see them. The hand of the evil people will not touch them. Their path and that of the destroyer will never cross. One of my classmates was burying his dad, I mean, the weekend. And then I was there with my wife and all that. And he said, well, some of our friends that should have come from Lagos, no, um, many of them didn't come. And then the few that came asked them, why didn't you show up? 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 They said, well, I'm afraid of kidnapping. No? I'm afraid of kidnapping. No? I'm afraid of kidnapping and all that. I said, we will not be part of that calamity. Do you believe in that statement? We will not be part. The Bible says a thousand will fall by our right hand. 10,000 by our left hand. It is only with our eyes we will see. The same road that they kidnap people, you will walk through that road and the kidnapper will not be on duty that time. Your path and that of the destroyer will never cross. Your path and that of your helper will always cross. In the name of Jesus. It's an extension of the mercy of God to secure us, to protect us, to shield us from evil. God's mercy secure his people. Even when they threw Daniel into the lion's den, God protected him. When they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace of fire, God secured their life. It will not end until God says so. Did you hear that? When they were going to throw Daniel in the lion's den, you know everybody will say that's the end of that man. Yes or no? That's the end of that man. That's the end of that man. Ah, that man is gone. Ah, that man is gone. That man is gone. But next morning, breaking news, Daniel came out from lion's den. The news of your deliverance will be a breaking news. You will go and you will come back. You will walk on the road. The ground will not swallow you. You will travel on the water. Your ship will not wreck. You will fly in the air. You will not suffer crash. Till Jesus come, plane will be crashing. But the plane that will crash, you won't be on board. 
Your children will not be on board. Nobody around you and around your emotions will be on board. The Bible says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. May you not do anything that will make you lose the presence of God. May the presence of God ever be with you. In all your journey, in all your movement, you will go well, you will come back better. You will always abore grace. will always rest upon you. You will always go well and come back better and return stronger and return richer and return wealthier. In the name of Jesus. That is on the ground of his mercy. Let me take the last one as we pray this morning. The mercy of God is manifested in his acting as a defense and refuge in the day of trouble. The mercy of God is manifested in his acting as a defense. God himself will act as a defense and refuge in the day of trouble. Acting as a defense. That's how God manifests his mercy. In his acting as a defense and refuge in the day of trouble. Psalm 59, I read verse 16. God's mercy defend and preserve his people. God's mercy defend and preserve his people. Psalm 59 verse 16. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense. Beloved, this is your experience from now on. The Lord will be your defense and refuge in the day of trouble. And refuge in the day of trouble. It will keep you. It will preserve you. It will defend you. You will know the blessing of divine defense. Even from now on. Where you will not be able to speak for yourself, God will speak for you. God will raise men of means. Men of influence. To defend you. To plead your cause. God will raise a friend from the camp of your enemy. That even when they are speaking evil about you in your absence, somebody out of them will just come and begin to defend you. You will not be defenseless. You will not be exposed. You will not be exposed to the devil. You will not be exposed to the attack of Satan. One man gave us a testimony. You know, he was, uh, he was coming from his place of work. And uh, he carried one of his friend. And then that his friend said, well, he wanted to just get a little petrol in the petrol station to use to power his generator in the evening. And this man said, okay, let me take you there. It was not the man that has the car that was driving that needed petrol. It was his friend that needed petrol. It happens in this town, this Akure town. I think about two weeks ago. And daylight robbery. As they came to the petrol station. And then his friend said, well, he didn't have something to get the petrol. So he was looking for a container to just get and get the little petrol he wanted to get. And then some boys just came. Holding guns. And they said, everybody lie down. And then the man that was still in the vehicle. When he saw those boys, he knew they were armed robbers. And he wanted to kick his vehicle around. They just crossed him in front and put a gun in his head and said, we'll just waste you. Come down. And then his friend that was looking for something to buy had already ran. Ran away. Lie down somewhere where they will not see him. And then they told this man to just come down from the vehicle. And the man came down from the vehicle. And they told him to lie down in the gutter. And he lied down in the gutter, his face on the ground. And they shot at him. Pa, pa, twice. He said he thought he was gone. He said he thought he was gone. That up till today, how that gun, bullet, missed him, he didn't know. They shot at him twice. Broad daylight. And then his friend that ran, that went to hide somewhere, started crying. That, ah, they have killed him. They are killing. 
Ah, they have killed him. Oh, oh, Boru Kogbeyi. Ah, Tori Tori Noda Shewasi Petro. Ah, ah, Labaja is dead and all that and all that. And then when those people collected what they want to collect, and they went. The man stood up, checked himself. He said, he even, he is even surprised. He expected to see a pool of blood. He had the gun, but nothing happened to him. And then he stood up, went into his car, and then, I mean, kicked the vehicle. And as he was about going, his friend said, Ha! You didn't die! You didn't die! <laughs> you will escape. <laughs> By the mercy of God. By the mercy of God. You know, in February, I escaped by mercy. That same grace is coming upon your life. No matter how strategic the attack of the devil is, you will escape. No bullet of the enemy will hit you. No arrow of death will come around you. The Lord will shield you. It will be unto you a wall of fire. It will come around your children. Wherever they are all over the world, the Lord will be their shield. It will come around your husband. It will come around your wife. It will come around your home. There is nothing to fear, beloved. This is the world of your father. He's in charge. You know why? He never sleep. He never slumber. Every time I want to sleep in the night, as I'm ready to sleep, I say, Lord, I hand over to you. I will, soon, I will soon be carried away by sleep. And I will not know what is happening around me. But let your glory take over this place. I hand over. I forbid any demonic trafficking in this place. I release angelic trafficking. I release the workings and the operations of the Holy Spirit. Nothing missing. Nothing stolen. Nothing spoiled. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Nothing missing. Nothing stolen. Nothing spoiled. Nothing, I am not fenceless. I may not have fence in my house, but God is my fence. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying now? I am not defenseless. The Lord will shield you. The Lord will defend you. The Lord will lay his hand upon you by mercy. You are shielded. You are protected. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Even if you pass through waters, it will not overcome you. Even if you pass through fire, it's not going to burn you. Even if you pass through flames of fire, it will not be kindled against you. You are going to walk through and you are going to survive. You are not just going to survive, you are going to live. You are going to fulfill God's purpose. You are going to fulfill your days. Your days will not be cut short. The rod of the wicked will not come upon the lot of the righteous. In the name of Jesus, you will get, get the good of this land. You will not partake in the sword of this land. In every land that is a good, in every land that is a sword, that is the sword of Nigeria, it has been killing a lot of people. But beloved, you will only have the good of this land. You will never partake in the sword of this land. The, the God whose eyes go through and fro all from different parts of the world will be keeping you. His mercy will sustain you. I hope somebody is blessed this afternoon. Let's rise up on our feet as we pray. There are two prayers we are going to pray before we go. The first one has to do with the first two points of how God manifests his mercy. I said the mercy of God is manifested in his pardoning of sin, especially when it is confessed and forsaken. You remember that? And I said the mercy of God is manifested in his bearing with sinners. He will be patient and then believing that they will repent. The first prayer is, Lord, I will not take your mercy for granted. In the name of Jesus. I will not take your mercy for granted. I want you to write the prayers down because I'm going to give you seven minutes to pray those prayers. I will not take it for granted. I will not take your mercy for granted. I will not take your mercy for granted. In the name of Jesus. I will not abuse your mercy. I will not abuse the mercy of God. I will not say because God is merciful, I will do what I like. I will not say because God is merciful, I will continue to commit sin. I will not say because God is merciful, I will exhaust his patience. I will not take your mercy for granted. The second prayer is in response to the third, the fourth, and the fifth point. If you look at the third, the fourth, and the fifth point, 
is about the blessings and the benefit of the mercy of God. I want you to deliberately connect your life and destiny permanently to the blessings and the benefit of the mercy of God. I connect my life and destiny permanently to the benefit of your mercy. In Jesus' name. I want you to pray with faith. That's your difference. God has spoken that mercy will be your difference. I connect my life and destiny permanently. Somebody say permanently. You can connect your children permanently to the blessings of the mercy of God, to the benefit of the mercy of God. You can connect your work. You can connect your finances. You can connect your health permanently to the benefit of the mercy of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Permanently. 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 I connect. That's why you'll be different from other people. Amen. 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 I connect my life and destiny permanently to the world. Benefit of the mercy of God in Jesus' name. Not just in this season, but in every season. I connect my life and destiny permanently to the blessings of the mercy of God. Where, I, where other people pass and they are dead, I will pass and I will leave. What happened to other people and they are gone? Even if it happens to me, I will still be alive. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Mercy will be my difference. Where other people fail, I won't fail. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? When they say that place is not safe and I have to pass through it, it will be safe as long as I pass through. It will be safe. Where other people have gone to and they close the door against them, when I get there, they will open the door. The same person that closed for some people will open the door for me. I want you to connect your life and destiny permanently. Somebody say permanently. To the benefit of the mercy of God. Connect your children. Connect your husband. Connect your wife. Let's rise up and begin to pray. You have the prayer. Begin to pray. Seven minutes. I want you to pray. I will not take your mercy for granted. I will not abuse your mercy. I will not abuse your mercy. I will not take your mercy for granted, Lord. What I'm supposed to do, I will do. Where I'm supposed to change, I will change. I will not frustrate the grace of God. I will not frustrate the mercy of God. I will not continue in sin and ask the Lord's grace to abound. In the name of Jesus. I connect my life and destiny permanently to the blessings of your mercy. In the name of Jesus. The mercy of God is my difference. The mercy of God is my distinction. The mercy of God is my peculiarity. The mercy of God is my difference. I escape by mercy. Where others don't find favor, I will find favor. This week... I connect my life and destiny to the benefit of the mercy of God. Let the mercy of God take over my life this week from the first day to the last day. I go safely, I return better. My health is solid on the ground of his mercy. My provision is guaranteed on the ground of his mercy. My help is guaranteed on the ground of his mercy. I will not be forgotten, I will be remembered. I will be remembered. I will be remembered. I will be remembered. What is mine, another will not take on the ground of his mercy. What is mine, another will not take. Every contention against my portion, I take authority over them. In the name of Jesus. What is mine, another will not take. What is mine, another will not take. In the name of Jesus. I walk through fire. It won't burn me. I walk through water. It won't overshadow me. In the name of Jesus, mercy of God is my difference. Mercy of God is my escape. Mercy of God is my distinction. In the middle of death, I will live. In the middle of sickness, I am healed. I am delivered. I am strengthening. In the middle of defeat, I will have victory. 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 I'm no longer a target of the devil. Every assault of hell, they miss their target in my life. In the name of Jesus, no arrow of sickness come around me. No evil before me, no sickness come near my dwelling place. 
Open your mouth and declare. Cover this week with the mercy of God. I come under the umbrella of the mercy of God. I bring my family under the umbrella of the mercy of God. No bad news this week. No evil occurring. No bad news this week. No evil occurring. By mercy we triumph. By mercy we escape. By mercy we are victorious. By mercy I succeed. In the name of Jesus. My children are saved. My family members are delivered. No evil news this week. In the name of Jesus. I sleep and wake up. I get stronger and stronger. No evil befall me. No sickness. No disease. Come near my dwelling place. Let's talk to the Lord. 